All right, so Luke chapter 11, great to have everybody here. Those joining us online, thank you for joining us online. Uh, we are going to uh, continue our, our study in the Gospel of Luke. Today, a message titled, Choosing Wisely, Choosing Wisely. And if you remember, we left off last week with a, a, a word of, of exhortation from Jesus, really, to Martha. Remember Mary and Martha, the two sisters, Mar Martha was busy, busy uh, serving and getting things ready, kind of taking care of stuff, which is good, right? As important as necessary, those kind of practical and tangible needs and opportunities. Uh, but Mary, her sister, had chosen to just sort of sit and to worship Jesus and listen to Jesus. And uh, Martha kind of wants Jesus to rebuke Mary for not helping, basically. And Jesus doesn't rebuke Martha for what she was doing, but she reminds Martha that Mary has chosen the greater thing, right? The most important thing, and that is to sit at the feet of Jesus and worship, right? That, that our worship, our relationship with him, our heart being surrendered to him is, is more important and really is primary to our service. Service is an outflow of that, that will come. It's an important outflow, right, to give back, but, but, but the, the truth is that that shouldn't take the place of, of that as, as Jesus says here, choosing that good part, right, the, the part of worship. And so, again, as I mentioned earlier, part of the reason that we start our service in worship is to really get our hearts sort of settled and right afresh before the Lord. And so we pick it up then in uh, Luke chapter 11, verse 1. Now it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place that when he ceased, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John, a reference to John the Baptist, also taught his disciples. And so one of his disciples, after about three years, right? Remember, we're on uh, the road to Jerusalem, the, the final journey to the cross, where Jesus, as the Bible tells us, has set his face like flint. He's determined that he's going to go to the cross because he knows that the greatest need of mankind, we can get focused on a lot of things, and there's a, there are a lot of needs, but the greatest need is the need for forgiveness, the need for reconciliation with the Lord, and he's going to the cross because he truly is the only one who can resolve that for us, right? The Lamb of God, as John says, who takes away the sin of the world. So after about three years, though, after walking with Jesus, after doing ministry with Jesus. Some of us have, you know, for years, right, served the Lord in various capacities in various places, perhaps even various countries, uh, different cultures. And, uh, you know, we, we've done that really in the power of Jesus by, by the Spirit of God. But imagine physically doing those things with Jesus, right? The, these folks had done that. And it's interesting to me of all the things that they could have asked him to teach them, they say, teach us to pray. You don't read of them saying, Lord, teach us to preach. Although no doubt they modeled uh, their, their preaching after Jesus. That's a good thing to do, right? You don't see them saying, Lord, teach us to heal. Some people focus an awful lot on that. Right? And that's good. Jesus heals people. But of all the things that Jesus did as they lived life together, serving God, they asked him to teach us to pray. And not only that, but teach us to pray as, as John also taught his disciples. So, I mean, John the Baptist. Now, this is a man's man. Right? You think of... When you think of John the Baptist, you know, he lived in a desert, you know, he ate locusts, he, you know, kind of uh, was a rugged guy. And one of the things that he took the time to teach his disciples was to pray. And perhaps the disciples of Jesus are asking Jesus to teach them that because as it says here, as he was praying when he had ceased. Perhaps they realized that that really was the source of his strength, 
his power, the victory in his life. Right? They, they asked him to teach us to pray. And it's interesting to me, by the way, not only, not, they don't ask, teach us how to pray. I right? notice that. He said, they say, teach us to pray. As if prayer perhaps was something they struggled with doing at all. Perhaps not, unlike we can be tempted to put off, right, to procrastinate on, to think that it's overwhelming or to think that we have to spend, you know, hours and hours and hours, right? A lot of reasons that we, uh, although none of us would say, I don't believe in prayer. I think if we, you know, had a show of hands, everybody would raise their hand. Yeah, I think prayer is a good thing, right? And there's all sorts of books on prayer and teachings on prayer and rightly so it's 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 critical ministries devoted to prayer uh, you know often they're the smallest ministry in the church you know and you know i think of the the uh the the bar owner uh as i remember the story who uh took a church to court because the uh church had been praying against his bar right that it would shut down and um uh after after some time it either burnt down or or something to to that effect and the bar owner sued the church right for praying that uh the bar would be shut down and when it was shut down the bar owner sued saying well they prayed for it and and it happened and the judge you know after hearing the case and the church defending it saying well that's you know no that's it's not our fault the judge said well one thing that's evident is the bar owner believes in the power of prayer and the church doesn't right? because the church was defending the reality, right? That uh, perhaps their prayers could have had an impact on that. That's, I don't know if that's a true story, but um, it makes an inter interesting point, right? The power of prayer and, and yet how, you know, we can, we can procrastinate on it. And I wonder if perhaps sometimes it's because we overcomplicate it. We'll see here a rather simple, uh, outline really of, of of prayer that Jesus gives us you know we recently celebrated what we call the National Day of Prayer uh, I think it's the first Thursday uh, of, of May and uh, I shared how actually the, the the president of the Iowa Senate shared the National Day of Prayer how he had gotten saved the, the year before at that very service at the Capitol and how wonderful it is to see God working really through many ministering down there at the Capitol having an impact on leaders in our state and um, how he had given uh, glory to God for that. And, and of course, as we all should, it's interesting, Abraham Lincoln, over 160 years ago, instituted kind of what you might call the precursor to that. But he called it, he called for a national day of humiliation, repentance, and prayer, right? Humil humiliation, repentance, and prayer. In Second Chronicles 7, 14, we read of my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways that I would heal their land. Interesting that Abraham Lincoln saw the Civil War as a judgment of God on a sinful nation. I don't know if you know that. He saw the Civil War as a judgment of God on a nation for the grievous sin of America over 160 years ago. A lot of people struggle with that idea. We, we call little J judgment, right? God's correction uh, of people who are on air because he loves enough to bring us back. And sometimes it takes serious things to get our attention. Perhaps one reason that we, we, we procrastinate on prayer is because we overcomplicate it. Look at just some, you know, what I would call principles or or an outline, if you will, of, of this very simple prayer. We often call the Lord's Prayer, but really it might be better called the Disciples' Prayer because they said, teach us to pray, and he, here's what he told them to pray. Our Father in heaven, uh, verse 2, of course, he says, when you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day, or give us this day our daily bread, and Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And don't lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Look, look, at, look at this as sort of, uh, there's a number of ways, but I would suggest as a model 
in a sense, maybe uh, 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 starting off with how simple it is. Just very simply, our Father in heaven, hallowed or, or holy is your name. Are they reminding God that he's holy, by the way? Are they reminding God that, that his name is to be hallowed, to be made holy? No, of course not. It's really sort of a reminder to themselves, right? G uh, Paul told us to pray without ceasing. Jesus uh, tells us to, to pray and continue praying. In fact, we'll see that a little bit later in our passage, right? Part of the reason, I think, is because God loves to hear from us. Another thing is that as we're persistent in prayer, right, it, it, it changes our heart. But, but you see this sort of simple, just our Father. S some people say Papa, Daddy, our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Holy is your name. Really just so simple. Not complicated. You know, sometimes people have all these long and sort of melodramatic introductions. And, you know, I don't, you know, mock those per se. But, but you know, God knows, you know, our hearts. Look at the simple outline here. Yet reverent. I think that's important, right? Sometimes we can, you know, the big man upstairs or, or you know, make light of kind of who God is, be sort of irreverent. You notice sort of the simplicity, the shortness, something like 68 words or 28 words, I should have counted, but um, uh, pretty short. But um, you see the, the simplicity of, of this prayer. But you also see what I would call the size of the ask. So, so pray simply, but don't be afraid to pray sizably, right? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If you think about the ramifications of that, that's a big ask. God, may your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's sizable. You know, when um, we were... I say we in reference to pregnancy because it's kind of like you're in it together. Um, but when, uh, we, uh, when we were pregnant with Josh and um, we were almost three weeks, but those of you who've had babies, you know, when you're about three weeks out from having a baby, you're about ready to, you know, be done. And, um, and so we were at church. I didn't know this, but I do remember the message. I remembered, and you, you could tell I, I uh, borrowed a little bit of it, but I remember Pastor Bob praying this, or, or kind of talking on prayer, and he said, pray sizably, pray specifically, and something else, another S, but, um, and a little did I know, but Becky took him literally, and she prayed that she would go into labor that day, and so we, we did our, our routine that night, and so, uh, I would sing to our kids in the womb, and I called it singing anyways. I don't know what they called it, but, um, or what Becky called it, but she was gracious and prayed, you know, laying hands. And, and then, uh, uh, if I remember correctly, while I was praying, right after all of a sudden, she's like, my water broke. And you know, that's go time, right? There, there, there's false contractions, and there's false this and that, but there's not false water breaking. <laughs> because there's a lot of water. And, and so it was go time. And it was like, as we're getting ready for bed, you know, and um, now Josh works overnight. So I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but, um, but uh, anyways, uh, I didn't know till later that Becky had prayed that she would go into labor that day. Pray sizably, pray specifically, and God, God heard. And I, I love as, as, uh, as we look at this, the simplicity, right? Yet the reverence, the, the sizably, when I think of, you know, asking for God's kingdom to come and God's will to be done. I mean, we should, and, and that's the cry of our heart, but that's a big, big ask. But we have a big, big God, a God who loves us and who is for us. And so, so pray simply, yet reverently, pray sizably, pray specifically, give us day by day our daily bread, right? That's a common need, you know. You can go for a little while without bread or food, but you can't go for a real long time. You know, we can go longer than I probably go, right? I probably should go a little longer sometimes, but like, uh, you can't go forever, right? And and uh, so he 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 prays specifically, right? Pray specifically, and then I would suggest.
for, forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us, not least to temptation, but deliver us from the evil. Pray in a surrendered way. Pray with a surrendered heart, a heart that says, not my will be done, Lord, but your will be done. Jesus modeled that. Some people mock that, right? Believe it or not, some preachers mock uh, praying that way. I don't know why they would do that. You know, they think that we command from God, that we can claim things, you know, demand that God give us things. Yet, um, Jesus modeled praying according to God's will. And so, so the, the simplicity of this prayer, right? If you have five minutes, take five minutes, right? Sometimes we, you know, I, I mean, we, we probably have some back there still or over here, kind of how to start a quiet time. And, I'll, and to be honest, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty lengthy, you know, and I think sometimes we can overcomplicate. It's good stuff that we should pray through and pray for, but like, don't feel like, oh, I don't have 30 minutes to tackle it all, so I'm not gonna pray at all. Take five, you know what I mean? It, but, but then converse, it's, in some respects, it's kind of an ongoing conversation throughout the day. And when you see this model prayer, when Jesus said, when you pray, which is assuming you do pray, right? And that's an important assumption, important thing to do. Pray, pray simply. He loves you. He's your father, your daddy, right? You, you think of the joy of, of holding our kids and the love that you have for them. And, and uh, uh, he, he loves that, right? He loves that time. And so simply yet reverently, sizably, you know, ask. Nothing's too big. And by the way, nothing's too small. You know, I, I think of how many times, some, I mean, very little, something's lost. Just the other day. You know, I couldn't find something, which seems to happen more often than I, I care to admit these days. And um, uh, I was, Lord, would you just, and I had, I had an idea, like, check the pocket, you know? And so I went into the, you know, because we're sort of that weather, you know, it's transitioning. Like, three, two days ago, you might have been wearing a coat, and now you, you got a tank top on or whatever. So I went and checked my coat pocket, and sure enough, there it was, what I was looking for, you know? The, nothing's too little, right? Pray. And... Uh, you know, I, I think sometimes to just be be open with the Lord, right? I, someone was joking about, you know, sometimes we can pray, especially in group prayer, kind of hinting to somebody, you know, I, even not sometimes we're closing a prayer, I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot to mention this. So, Lord, blah, 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 like <laughs> preaching in prayer, you know what I mean? You know, just keep it simple. Just keep it focused on the Lord who loves you and who is for you. And, and I think it can be a, a wise idea, sometimes can be challenging to remember to be focused on who God is. You, you often notice prayers in the New Testament. God, you know, we sang God of Wonders this morning. I love how Ben opened that, right? You know, and, and I, I think you'll see in, in Acts praying, you know, God who created the heavens and the earth. Are they reminding God? Hey, no, no, they're reminding themselves. This is who you're talking to. Man, he's powerful. He's got your back. He can take care of you. He not only can, but he wants to. I, and, and we'll read in a little bit about the, the importance of persistence in prayer, keeping after it. You know, because as we pray, God changes us. As we pray for things that perhaps we don't get, God changes us. I think there's also a, an element where we spend that time. God likes that time. We need that time. So it can help us to keep short accounts. Verse five, he, he says, which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves for a friend of mine has come to me on his journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer him from within and say, don't trouble me, the door, uh, don't trouble me from within. No, I'm sorry. Don't trouble me. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you, though, he will not rise and give to him because he is a friend. Yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. So in other words, you know, someone comes in the middle of the night, knocks on your door um, and, you know, asks for some bread because they had company come from out of town. Basically, is the idea here. You know, he says, how many of you would, you know, say, well, come back in the morning. I think that would be sort of common, even more so if you consider the culture right at this time for kind of the average uh, family would have basically a one room home and the whole family, including in many cases, the animals, right, would sleep on about an eight inch elevated, uh, uh, you know, bed, if you want to call it that, but really an elevated surface. And for warmth's sake, there would be a little fire in the middle of that. 
and they would have their animals. You've, you've heard of a three dog night, right? Or it's cold enough and you need three dogs around you to stay warm. So they would have all their kids because it's, it, that's how they, they lived at the time. All, all their kids in bed. Some of us maybe do that now, all the, the pets, you know, and, and they're warm. And so you could imagine, especially with younger kids, you get up and you, you know, get bread and you, you know, the whole household's awake now and the goats are running around and, and those things are annoying. I worked, you know, at a place one time that if I didn't keep my feet moving, the goats would nibble off the end of my shoelaces. Um, uh, that's a whole other story. But anyways, um, you know, so, you know, the, 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 but, but the point here is like, but if you keep on, the friend keeps on knocking, you're probably going to get up. Okay, okay, just go away. Here's the bread, right? You know, and the idea is not that, you know, badger God and he'll give you what he wants or, or what you want or that God reluctantly blesses us. But the idea here is the idea of being persistent. I say though he will not rise, uh, yet because of his persistence, he will rise even as he many, uh, give him as many as he needs because of persistence, right? The, the point here is to be persistent in prayer. And then he, to, to highlight that further, he says, so I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find and knock, and it will be open for everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be open. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? The, a rhetorical questions, right? The answer is, of course not. Uh, uh, the, the dad's gonna be gonna bless him, right? And do the do. You're not, he's not gonna give him a scorpion and poison him, right? Um, Verse 13, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So keep on asking for the Spirit of God, for the wisdom of God, for the direction of God. Keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. And our, our principle here, our first point, our first takeaway, is victory through prayer is a lot closer than you think. Victory through prayer is a lot closer than anything. Don't overcomplicate it. Just make sure you talk to God. Right? That, that's the takeaway for us. Because they, they ask, his disciples ask him to teach them to pray. <laughs> Not how to pray. Just teach us to pray. Because like we see you praying so often. And we see the results of that. And Jesus shares this rather simple but profound but personal and sizable and specific with a heart of surrender prayer. So victory through prayer is a lot closer than you think. Secondly, as we move on, we'll see that victory in spiritual warfare is realized through setting Jesus on the throne, making him really the center of our lives. Now Jesus goes in to, uh, in verse 14, he says, and, and, and well, we continue on, right? And Luke tells us that as he, that is Jesus was casting out a demon and it was mute, so it was when the demon had gone out that the mute spoke and the multitudes marveled. So in this case, this was a mute, someone who couldn't speak. And in this particular case, it was because of a demon. That's not always the case, right? There's uh, medical reasons for that at times, but in this particular case, the demon caused him to not be able to speak. But some of them said uh, of Jesus that he casts out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons, or by Satan, the Lord of the flies, a reference to the devil that in other words Jesus is casting out devils by the power of the devil which which of course makes no sense right and Jesus uh, tells them that right um, others testing him sought from him a sign from heaven but he knowing their thoughts said to them every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation and a house divided against itself cannot fall if Satan also is divided against himself. How will his kingdom stand? Because you say I cast out demons by Beelzebub. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges. But if I cast out demons, notice this, <laughs> with the finger of God. It doesn't say that even the mighty hand of God or you know the, the, all the hoopla, but by the little finger of God. You know, I, 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 there's a couple of cool illustrations, I think, with that one. It's just the, the flick. You know, some people think of, like, the devil and God is, as equals. God's not equal. The devil's not equal to God. God's not equal. God is so far superior. He cast out devil at the flick of a finger. 
But also something I think equally as powerful is we're reminded of, of the woman uh, caught in the very act of adultery when, when they, they brought her to Jesus and said she's caught in the very act of adultery. What do you say we should do? Their hypocrisy is shown in part by they only brought her. If she's caught in the very act of adultery, who is she with? Where is he? Right? But they didn't bring him. They just brought her. How did Jesus put down that hypocrisy? He stooped down. And he started writing with his finger in the, in the dust of the ground. Many believe because they walked away, oldest from youngest. He says, he who is here without sin, let him cast the first stone. And that terminology suggests the same sin, right? The sin of adultery, whether it's physical or whether it was lustful or, or, or whatever the case may be, right? Some suggest, and I think it's uh, 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 likely that he stooped down, he wrote their names from oldest to youngest, and he wrote the name of a woman, perhaps, next to their name, someone they had been lusting after or perhaps involved with. And he says, whoever of you is without the same sin, let him cast the first stone. And then when it got down to only Jesus being left, the only one who could cast a stone because the only one who was innocent, he said, I don't find fault with you. Importantly, go and sin no more. It's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance, the Bible says. Right. And so um, nevertheless, here we back back in our in our text. Right. He, he says here that, that a house divided against itself uh, cannot stand. Um, where we go. OK, so verse 19, if I cast out demons by, by Beelzebub, whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they'll be your judge. But if I cast out with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man fully armed guards his own palace, his goods are in, in peace. But when a stranger, a, a stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoils. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. And then he gives this important principle, right? And uh, why I say that victory in spiritual warfare is realized through setting Jesus on the throne. Verse 24, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest, finding none. He says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and they dwell there. And the last state of the man is worse than the first. He's talking about the importance, right, of making sure that Christ is on the throne, right? You know, there's over the years, there's kind of, seems they sort of rise and, come to prominence in the fall, sort of what you call deliverance ministries or just a, a, an overwhelming focus on casting out demons. And, and there's a place for that, don't get me wrong, it's very real, right? But it's the important thing is, is to make sure that Christ is on the throne, to make sure that um, when, when you encounter someone who has a demon, that the, the key is to bring them to Jesus, right? right? The Bible says that greater is he who is in you, speaking to believers, than he who is in the world. And so uh, that, that's the key. Sometimes you'll see people casting out demons and, and um, you know, I've been involved in a, you know, kind of a handful of those kind of things. Some, you know, a little skeptical about what's really going on here, you know, and others where it's very, very, uh, very clear that it's very, very real. And uh, the urgency of, of this issue here, making sure that Jesus is on the throne. Our job is not to just get people to clean up their acts, right? But our job is to get people, to introduce people to Jesus, that he would become the Lord of their life, the ruler of their life, the one who, who guides their life, right? That Christ is in fact on the throne. I remember um, one time someone that we had, we had known for a number of years and interacted off and on and um, what, out of the blue, after a long time, kind of called and, and uh, wanted to come back to church and did. And uh, this young man had, had got connected with a young lady who, who her ex-boyfriend was part of the Church of Satan. And she was into that whole uh, space, you know, demonic worship. And, and uh, it, not with that guy any longer, but clearly still influenced. And over the course of the following week, you know, uh, you, you could tell here just very agitated and, and you know, the name of Jesus. And, and uh, throughout that week, um, 
a lot of time on the phone and eventually the demon speaking through this young man and uh, realizing the, the, the realness of this, right? First kind of skeptical as you, as you sort of hear this and you know, hey, what have you been smoking? What have you been drinking? But then over the course of a number of days and as, as, um, as uh, the conversation goes on and find out a little bit more about the background and uh, you know, there's all sorts of, you go online and you could, you, you, you see all sorts of kind of what I would call shenanigans or, or hoopla that, that people will tell you, go oh, do this and do this and do this and see this and that, you know, in the name of Jesus and do this. But, but it's important to realize when we pray in the name of Jesus, the references to the character of Christ. Remember when the disciples, uh, uh, Peter, James, and John, and Jesus came down from the Mount of Transfiguration, what, what, were, what was the Father coming to the disciples wanting them to do is to cast out a demon. And remember, they couldn't cast out this demon. And Jesus said that this kind only comes out by prayer and fasting. In other words, this isn't a magical formula. This is, this, this is a power that is sustained power. This is a, a preparedness. You need a preparedness by, by, I believe, by walking in the power of the Spirit and the nature of Jesus. I remember when, um, I mean, because we, 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 we did it all talking to this couple. And, and um, you know, I remember at one point that, and it's, I know it sounds, sounds odd. It's not like something I get involved with every day or even every year, but a demon threatening our lives and uh, realizing where this was from is on the phone, don't worry. And, um, uh, but uh, the focus, right, throughout that, just a, a supernatural peace as sort of unsettling in some ways as it was, but a supernatural peace pointing the people back to the Lord, praying to receive Christ, because that's the key. Right, right. The key is to make sure that Christ is on the throne because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And do you know that by the end of the week, they turned over all their Satan worship toys. We burned them. And, and uh, actually, a while back, they're out of the area now. They're separated out of the area. And not too long ago, he reached out and said, thank you. Thank us for, for how God had used the ministry. And, you know, and that's not something that... Uh, in some ways, kind of fortunately, we haven't had to deal with a lot, but it's, it's very real. But the principle is, is something that Jesus outlines here. And, and that is that realizing that victory in spiritual warfare is realized through setting Jesus on the throne and, and making sure that, that he's the center, right? Because he, he says that if you don't do that, that demon is going to go out and find seven friends and come back and the individual is going to be in a worse place than he was in the beginning, right? Because the house is all cleaned up and it's better and they come back and they, they make it worse. And so no, no uh, coincidence, verse 27, it happened as he spoke these things that a certain woman from the crowd raised her voice and said to him, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts which nursed you. But he said, more than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. That's the key, right? Making sure that Christ is on the throne. This week I read someone said, the Lord told me is no substitute for the Bible says. You understand what I'm saying? You'll hear people say, brother, the Lord told me to tell you. And I, I appreciate that. I love the boldness, right? I love the, the love, right? When someone comes in, in a right heart to share something with you that God puts on their heart, but it's important to always check it by God's word. Right? And that's why uh, the Lord told me, when someone says the Lord told me, that's no substitute for the Bible says. Measure it with what the Bible says. Make sure that, you know, in the beginning of the word, the word was what with God and the word was God. Jesus Christ is, is the word, the word is God. Right? Make sure that our hearts and our lives are in the right, right space. Verse 29, while the crowds were, were thickly gathered together, he began to say, this is an evil generation. It seeks a sign and no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. For as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so also the son of man will be to this generation. The queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. 
for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and indeed a greater than Solomon is here, of course, speaking of himself. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For if they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed a greater than Jonah is here, right? People that weren't repenting, even at the name of Jesus or at the ministry of Jesus, right? No one, um, or, 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 and so again, the idea there that, that it's not about signs and wonders. Those are great. Signs and wonders uh, can follow and do follow the preaching of the word of God and the surrendering of lives. Sometimes, by the way, those wonders could be just making it. You know what I mean? Just getting through the day, right? Sometimes just getting up, being faithful to what God has called us to do, living life in the power of the Holy Spirit, being faithful to what God has called us to do, right? Stay in, stay in the course. <clears throat> Not seeking just those signs. And, and uh, but, but a life surrendered. Victory in spiritual warfare is realized through setting Jesus on the throne. I gave sort of a, 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 what I would call kind of an extreme example, right? Because that's what Jesus is dealing with here. Right, that's the example he's giving. There's a lot of other ways that the enemy tries to come, uh, come against us. He lies to us. He deceives us. He tries to get us off track from God's word, just like he did with Eve in the garden. Did God really say? Then he got more bold. The Lord didn't say, even though it is, in fact, what God has said. A lot of ways that uh, we're told in the scriptures, I think, Peter, to, to be uh, uh, aware of the ways or the strategies of the devil because it's real and and so but to push back with the truth of the word of god paul told timothy that god has not given us a spirit of fear but of power and of and of love and of a sound mind right a mind that is stayed on the word of god that is focused on the word of god these these have to do with choices but at the end of the day, the choice is kind of going my own way or, or going the way of surrender unto the Lord, the Lord who loves me, the Lord who is for me, the Lord who has gone to the greatest of lengths to demonstrate his love for you and me on the cross. As I mentioned earlier, Jesus knew that the greatest need of all of humanity, of all of mankind, would be the need for forgiveness. And so he set his face like flint, and, and he went to the cross so that we could have the opportunity to be rejected or, or to be forgiven, right, and not be rejected, right? God's plan for us is a plan of purpose, a plan of hope, a plan of peace, right? But sin gets in the way of that sin kind of big picture sin but then our personal sin gets in the way of that but you see that's the problem but the remedy the solution is what we celebrated this morning the lord's table the cross of christ where where the playing field is made level right where the blood of jesus christ runs down that cross and if you if you picture your sins you know written on that cross there and the blood of christ covering those all of your sin, past, present, and future. That's why it's so important, I think, to remember as I, I shared, maybe I was <laughs> preaching in prayer myself this morning, I'm not sure, but, but where if anyone is in Christ, the Bible says he's a new creation. That word new means fresh, constantly fresh. Right? You're, we're a new creation. That's how God sees you when he looks at you through the lens of love. We're going to talk about that next week, right? We're, we're talking about choices, but, but choices that God doesn't call us to make and to carry out on our own because he loves us. He gives us his spirit to enable us, to empower us. He goes before us and he prepares the way. He comes behind us and I'm thankful he cleans up the messes often, right? And, and, he, and he carries us when needed. You've all heard those illustrations that he's a loving father. Who is for you greater love has no one than this the bible says than to lay down his life for his friends and that's what jesus did for you and that's what he did for me and so the, the solution
to the problem of sin, to the, to the breach that sin causes in our relationship with the Lord, the solution is the cross of Christ. And that's achieved through simply trusting in the Lord, trusting in his, uh, his plan, trusting in what he has done for us, his act of dying for us on the cross because he loves you and because he is, in, he is for you. Next week, as we wrap up this chapter, we're going to see that we have a choice on our outlook. We're going to be encouraged to choose our outlook wisely as Jesus uh, teaches us uh, about the lamp of the body, right? How we choose to view life, right, impacts, uh, to, to view life and people impacts your whole life, right? Jesus gives a beautiful illustration of that. How, how, how we view things, right? You, you, you've heard me and perhaps others talk about living through the lens of love. Right? Do, do we first filter things through love? When we look at life, right, do we look at life through the problems and we view God through the problems of life? Or do we look at the Lord and view the problems of life through the magnitude of God? Right, which is the better view, right? So we'll, we'll see to choose our outlook wisely. And then, uh, and then the importance of focusing on, on the internal, right? The internal. He's going to rebuke the Pharisees, right? And the issue is really an issue of, of the heart to focus on keeping our character solid before the Lord, keeping our heart and our mind clean and knowing that God will take care of the rest. It's, it's absolutely a mind-blowing and life-changing change of perspective <clears throat> to realize how God sees you, the love which with he sees you, the, the, the lens of love that he looks through when he sees you, the, the plans that he has for you, the power that he has available to help you to live for him in these dark and difficult days. And the, the, what the Bible calls a future and a hope that we have through our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. There, there's nothing like it. I'm so grateful for the fact that in, in these times that uh, we have a, a loving God, right, who is greater, who is grander, who is more powerful, who is everywhere, who loves us, and who is perfectly capable of taking care of the things that concern our heart. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God. And when we see God as who he is, it's like those things I just mentioned, the God who loves you and who is for you, that should I will want to say it should come naturally, but it really doesn't come naturally. But it should come much easier, right, to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, doing uh, the right things in his sight. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things, the things that we so often worry about, the Bible says will be given to us. That's the kind of God that we serve, a God who loves us, who went to great lengths, the Bible says that God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. The very thing that a lot of the world thinks, God's out to condemn us. He's out to judge us. He's out to take away our fun. Not true. Jesus said God didn't send his son to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. Why did he say that? Because the world needs to be saved. We need the Lord. Amen. And God is here. He's for us. And so next week we'll wrap up this study. On, on choosing wisely, and we'll see uh, these contrasts with the beautiful truths of, of the, the, the life surrendered to the Lord who loves us, who has gone to great lengths to show us that, and who has great plans for us. Amen.